buy $297,000 in cash flow every year for $49,500. You have to partner with the dentist for this specific purchase, but you go and get an SBA loan with 10% down and buy a dental practice. It will take on $440,500 worth of debt for the purchase. Now you need to make sure that you can pay the debt from the cash flow. Debt payments are going to be about $10,000 a month and you'll have $177,000 left over for the year. Use this for salary for an operator slash dentist and growth. Next, you have to identify potential red flags. Why has the practice only been open a few days per week through its existence and will the employees stay despite increasing operational days? Next, identify the value add opportunities and strengths. There's currently no marketing and most of their business comes from good word of mouth, which means they treat their customers right. Go to your team to underwrite. This means your accountant, your lawyer, your equity partner, and maybe a due diligence company. Buy this business and watch the cash flow roll in as you scale and learn. Now, in order to buy this business and learn and scale, you're gonna have to partner with a dentist. And why? Well, you can't really own like hospitals or dental practices or I think even accounting firms in some states without being that type of professional, which is why a lot of these small businesses have trouble growing and scaling because you have a technician who got really good at what they do, but they're not really good at the business of what they do. So you will of course be a minority shareholder. You can't own the majority of the practice, which means maybe it's a 51 49 split or maybe a 60 40 70 30, whatever the law tells you you have to do. That's how you have to buy the business. Just max out your equity because of course we are all here for equity and cash flow. So when we get that equity and cash flow, of course, we create impact. Let's not get it twisted. We're not just here for equity and cash flow, but the money is a means to an end. As you're partnering with this dentist and you realize that you're going to be the minority shareholder, you are preferably doing it with someone you have a prior relationship with. And that's just because trust is the foundation of all of these things. And if you don't trust who you're going into business with, it is very hard to execute well. Now, on the opposite end, if you have a really crappy network, maybe you have nobody that you can trust to go into business with. If that is the case, A, you need to become a better version of yourself so that you can attract better people, so that you can trust them, so that you can go into business with them, which means you need to become a more trustworthy person. Speaking to myself here, just as much as I'm speaking to you. But B, you need to go out and network more and kind of start cutting off the people who aren't adding to your dreams and goals and adding people who are adding to your dreams and goals and not cut them off all the way, but stop just shooting the breeze with them for four hours when you could be bettering your life and helping them better their life. If people aren't willing to improve, maybe it's time to limit the amount of time you spend with them, not cut them off completely, although some of the times cutting them off completely is the best move. Once you preferably have somebody you trust, you know you're the minority shareholder, you wanna lay out the specifics of the partnership. Who's bringing the money? How much money are we bringing? What's the equity split? What's the cash flow split? What's the operational split? Are you gonna be the dentist and I'm gonna handle the marketing? Am I gonna go become a dentist? Am I just gonna handle uh, kind of customer success and we bring somebody in for marketing? How is this all going to work? Are we gonna have a COO? Are we gonna buy more practices? Are we gonna scale? What's the cash flow goal? What's the exit goal? How much work do we wanna do in the meantime? How many years do we wanna do this for? Start to lay all that stuff out in the partnership. Then after you kind of get that partnership locked down, you have the dentist, preferably it's somebody you know, and you have the nitty gritty of all the operational and finance kind of to-dos that you have to check off. You go to the red flags. And the red flag I noticed, again, I go to Biz Buy Sell for all these opportunities and I was looking over it and they brought up that the practice was only open for a few days a week. And my question is why? Of course, the owner that is a dentist may just want to work a few days a week. They might be in that kind of retirement mode where they're like, I had a good income. I prioritize spending time with my kid and my spouse. So I didn't want to work more than I had to. And for that reason, the practice is only open a few days a week, or maybe they don't have enough business from the word of mouth. Maybe they know a lot about supply and demand and they're manipulating that by closing um, down for a few more days a week than other practices. Regardless, it's a bit of a red flag to me. I want to know the reason. It could be a good reason, it could be a bad reason, but I wanna dive more in to that reason. Then the other red flag is, I'm trying to maximize cash flow. So when I buy it, we'll probably be operating it every day of the week that dental practices typically operate. 
And so will the employee stay despite increasing days in operation? It's a serious question to ask and it's definitely a red flag because I would plan on increasing those days of operation. And if they're used to that two or three day work week and now all of a sudden they're doing five, six days a week, am I gonna have to double my staff? That's going to incur another cost. Is that a cost I'm willing to incur? Can the business absorb that cost? Those are all the questions that I'm starting to ask for the red flags portion of this. Now, for the value add opportunities where it's like, hey, I can come in, I can bring value here. I'm looking at the fact that there's no marketing. All of their growth has come from word of mouth, which is a beautiful thing. Cause that means A, they treat their customers well, and B, they know how to get referrals. So I probably don't have to do a ton with the infrastructure there, but they're not marketing, which means I can start doing direct mail campaigns. I can start kind of bringing in an affiliate program where I incentivize people to bring in more referrals maybe. I don't know, I wouldn't want to touch the great word of mouth that they already have going. But what I would do is I would realize this is a chance to study great word of mouth and then build on it. What are they doing well? And then how can we do more of it better? So do more better with a great word of mouth and then start marketing. Start either doing direct mail, Facebook ads, tweak the offer to have a freebie to bring more people in so we can max out our operational days, max out our cash flow, and start to acquire some more dental practices in the future. Now, we've talked about red flags, we've talked about value add opportunity, we talked about the partnership, and then it comes down to your team. And this is simply a reminder, I'm every week I'm doing episodes on kind of buying a business and underwriting a business and what red flags I saw, what green lights I saw and kind of the partnership and everything behind the business that I see from just looking at it for five to 10 minutes. But I will always have this reminder in every one of these episodes, build your network. Go to the networking events for mergers and acquisitions, go to the conferences for mergers and acquisitions, get on LinkedIn and connect with people, get on Twitter and tweet at people and connect with people who are in the M&A space, people who are buying and selling businesses, talk to business brokers, talk to accountants, talk to lawyers, talk to due diligence companies, and start to build out your list of people that can help you when it comes time to acquire your business. Get into communities of people doing business. That looks like Pace Morby's community. I think he has a zero down community where they're really focused on creative finance. You have Cody Sanchez, who's really focused on helping people buy boring businesses. Get into communities where people are doing the do and start networking at these events and through LinkedIn and Twitter so you can build up your network so that when it comes time to close, you're prepared. And that's what we got for you guys today on the show. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you on the next one. And remember, we are a community of people judged not by our wealth, but by our impact.